slight technical problem here, but it was overcome. So I'm quite excited about our presentation and our presenters today. Um, I want to thank uh, Dr. Moorcroft, who's co-chair of this conference, Dr. Frid, Dr. Maloney, and Dr. Leventhal for coming here. Um, they are international speakers. I've heard them speak. I know them through the International Lyme Association, ILADS. I've worked with them as well as we, we share mutual patients. So I think you're in for a very good presentation this morning. I also wanted to thank Deanne Fitzgerald, Casey Monroe, uh, Jenny Garbus, and Gary Estero for their efforts in coordinating this. Uh, it wasn't, uh, it, it was more than I expected. And thank you very much for putting this all together and thank you for participating in this. I'm gonna give a brief introduction today about why we're doing this particular program here at NORA. Um, I'd like to go into some of those reasons briefly. Then Dr. Moorcroft is going to discuss his introduction. And we have a guest speaker today, and that's Maddie Thomas. Maddie Thomas uh, is a celebrity. She's a television celebrity. And her husband, you may know, is Rob Thomas, the well-known so uh, singer and songwriter. Uh, Mary is my patient, and she has Lyme disease. And she's also a founder of a not-for-profit organization for animals. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that when we get to that point of the presentation. But the reason for this symposium is that Lyme disease affects neurology. And when that happens, the visual process is affected. Over the past month, I've had at least four children come into my practice where the parents brought the children in. Three were with an undiagnosed etiology, and one came in with concussion. When these patients were going, went through the visual examination, I noticed some very interesting things about the exam, and we decided to test for Lyme disease. And all four children came out positive. Even the concussion patient, who was everybody was putting the symptoms on the concussion. The other interesting thing about these four children is that they all presented with visual problems. And when they presented with visual problems a year ago, two years ago, parents took them to eye doctors. All four were two optometrists. All four diagnosed convergence insufficiency and accommodative insufficiency and did therapy. And the therapy didn't help. Two of the children dropped out of the therapy because it was so uncomfortable for them. So this is what I've seen in my practice over and over again. Dr. Syed and I see these patients all the time. Probably since January, we've had at least 20 patients where we've picked up signs and characteristics of Lyme disease on visual evoked potential, fundus photographs, and OCTA. I'm going to share this with you. If we're picking up at least 20 patients since January and making the diagnosis and referring them out to physicians who are specialists, I can only imagine the number of patients that are out there and that you're probably seeing and not recognizing as having this very difficult disease to detect. So the purpose of this program is to bring forward a new idea that we as optometrists and ophthalmologists should be at the front line in picking up the characteristics and symptoms related to Lyme disease. And we should be doing some of the initial testing in order to get these patients to the physicians that are appropriate. One final thing, I was talking to uh, someone up in Rochester, New York about uh, three weeks ago. And he knew that we were gonna be presenting this Lyme and Vision Symposium. And he said, oh, you know, he said, uh, we now have uh, Lyme disease in Rochester. I said, what? He said, well, you know, we've got Lyme disease up here now. I said, what are you talking about? He said, well, the CDC, Center for Disease Control, has just redrawn the map, and now Rochester was in the line of Lyme disease. I said, you've got to be kidding. I said, what happens if you're in Buffalo? He said, well, I don't think they've got it yet. <laughs> so, you know, those ticks crawl very slowly, and, you know... <laughs> 
maybe that's the way the CDC is moving these days. But anyway, I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Moorcroft. He's going to give his introduction, and then we'll go on from there. Great. Um, I really wanted to thank everybody for in inviting all of us. I mean, this, when uh, Dr. Padula approached me about working on this conference together, I mean, it, it really felt right because... You know, these are the patients that we see every day. You know, I have um, a large pra uh, part of my practice in treating tick-borne illness is children. And we see, I, I mean, I just had a, a girl that Dr. Padula and I share who was diagnosed with somatoform disorder, depression, anxiety, and oh, by the way, she has learning processing disorders, visual spatial issues, and, and so she should go for psychiatry, right? And unfortunately, they missed the tick-borne illness you know, they miss the learning disabilities and they label these children and then they just send them down this, this hallway of darkness. And so we, it was really nice to have dinner last night with a lot of the people who will be presenting today because we're all coming from the same perspective. We want to present things um, that have to do with real science. We want to tell you what that science is and we want to critically evaluate that. And we want to do it in such a way that um, we're able to help you know, our patients. And that's really, it's a patient-centered care model that we all utilize. And when we stray from that I, is where I see all the issues. Um, and I'm trying really hard to not go off on my sort of tangents of all these war stories because there's so many children and adults who are suffering in all of our practices. But I do know that Oklahoma also now has Lyme disease. Um, and the way I know that was because a friend of mine diagnosed somebody with an erythema migrans rash. And he called the local Department of Health and he said, hey, this person has an erythema migraines rash. And they're like, we don't have Lyme in Oklahoma. <laughs> and he said, well, I think you do because I just diagnosed this. Oh, that person must have traveled. No, they hadn't. So what happened was it was really cool. The guy had actually ordered lab tests that came back positive for Lyme disease and it looked acute. And then they said, nope, can't be possible. So then the patient goes, I have a baggie with a tick in it. And they were like, oh, damn, we have deer ticks in Oklahoma. It must have come from a songbird. And I'm like, well, yeah, duh, that's how it works. And I mean, so they might crawl slowly from Rochester to Buffalo, but they're flying on airplanes, too. And, I mean, it, and so and, um, a person who has influenced a lot of us is Charles Ray Jones, who's a 90-year-old pediatrician who's still on the front lines working day in and day out to work with children who are suffering and to stand up and speak for them. And I mean, I think, you know, he has all these crazy quotes, but what basically if, if, you know, what the mind doesn't want to see, the eyes can't possibly see. And so we, we deal all the time with practitioners and, and legislators who don't want to look at the real science. But, you know, the more and more we focus on science, the more and more we can change things for our patients you know, and unfortunately, some of us in the room have their own children who are patients. And we have friends who are patients. And we have celebrities who are patients. And the beauty of our society is we are consumer-driven and our patients are speaking up. And if we use the science, it backs up with our patients are experiencing. And that's what we want to impart today is that science so that you can then, you know, critically evaluate that and then apply that in your practices. So I, I hope it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, and thank you so much for inviting us. So, you know, maybe these ticks are faster moving than we expect. <laughs> Didn't I hear something about super ticks? Yeah. Well, okay. As you'll, as, as you'll learn later, um, what you were taught in school and what you read on the Internet are sometimes not the reality. We have ticks that are kind of super ticks that are filled with multi, many, many, many things that do really crazy things. So... I think we'll hear more about super ticks later on in the morning. Okay, that'd be great. <laughs> Unfortunately. Unfortunately, is right. Okay, I'm going to introduce uh, Ms. Maddie, uh, Mrs. Maddie Thomas, and she's going to give a presentation by video. She suffers from tick-borne disease, so she was unable to come here personally. But I did. Let's make sure that it works. Hi, my name is Marisol Thomas. 
As someone dealing with autoimmune disease, as well as Lyme, Babesia, Bartonella, and a host of other co-infections, my journey has been a long and brutal one. It took many years to be properly diagnosed as I continued to worsen. I had a few years of nonstop treatments and protocols which helped get some of my many conditions under control in varying degrees, yet some of my most debilitating symptoms were still present and nothing was helping. The symptoms were so bad I could barely function some days or even leave my home. I've continued to suffer from electrocuting pain that goes from my temples into my eyes that sometimes is so violent it's caused me to go into seizure type episodes. I have severe vice-like head pain and pressure, intermittent TMJ disorder. I developed an advanced, incredibly painful condition called adhesive capsulitis, also known as a frozen shoulder. I have ear and pain pressure that's so bad, it feels like I'll go mad and forces me to wear earplugs almost 24 seven. Loud sounds cause them to pop and creates a horrible crackling sound as if an old transistor radio is being tuned. This causes indescribable pain and panic. I have light sensitivity where I can't tolerate bright lights, even on a cloudy day or in the house. Blurry vision where I can't see from far or from near, and my vision seems to continually change, sometimes even daily. I have height and depth instability. Objects appear to move even when they're stationary. One of my favorite ways to relax and escape has always been reading, and that has not only become impossible, but has also become a great source of anxiety. I have such textual bombardment that just reading a paragraph is incredibly difficult. All the words jumble together as if they're all trying to come into focus all at once, causing me to be unable to see anything at all and become panicky. This also happens if I just wanna sit outside in my yard with my dogs, which is another thing that has always brought me great happiness and a feeling of safety and security. Instead, it now feels as if the trees and the air itself is attacking, once again, sending me into a panic attack. All these unexplained, uncontrolled symptoms, unsurprisingly, have also caused me to develop a severe panic disorder. I truly started to think I was finally going crazy after all these years. Luckily, I have the support of an amazing family and support system that although have no idea what I was explaining to them, knew that this was very real and not just something in my head. I was really fortunate to be introduced to Dr. William Padula. Meeting him was so important on so many levels. First, he assured me that what was happening to me was, in fact, very real. He also helped me understand that eye doctors couldn't find anything wrong because this is actually a neurological condition that they were missing. With his help, I was also able to see that so many of these unrelated symptoms are actually very connected. My spatial visual process has been compromised by the tick-borne disease. About 70% of all sensory nerves in the body comes from the two eyes. So it turns out that all my visual issues, plus many of these other symptoms that remained after so many medical treatments, were not only related, but are due to my compromised spatial visual process that is causing an abnormal postural tone, which is then causing accommodative spasms in my eyes. It's these spasms that can cause many of the symptoms I experience. The electrocuting pain, the head pressure, the dizziness, the ear issues, the severe visual issues, and the panic attacks. It also seems that the adhesive capsulitis came from the increased abnormal postural tone that affects everything from the neck down to the shoulders. It's even affected how I walk and how I stand. I realize everyone's prognosis is different, including how well they'll respond to rehabilitation, which for me consists of physical therapy to help with my posture and balance issues that have occurred due to my visual dysfunction, as well as the use of special glasses with special yoked prisms. My long, scary journey is far from over, and it's still very unsure. But I wanted to send out this message to all of you attending this Lyme Disease Vision Symposium, because aside from trying to find a course for my own healing, I want to somehow be able to help the many people who continue to suffer without diagnosis. All of you listening to my story right now can help make that happen. Many people with tick-borne disease develop visual symptoms in the early stages of infection. And for some, it clears up as the Lyme and co-infections are treated. But for many like me, 
With lack of proper diagnosis and treatment, this leads to lifelong, severely debilitating neurological issues that affect your whole body. That is something that not many Lyme literate doctors even understand. This is not just a visual condition. This is a neurological condition that affects so much more than just your vision. It can affect your entire body and it can literally steal your life. Because this is something that has had such an impact on my life, I hope to spread more awareness of this terrible condition brought on by neurological Lyme. I'm hopeful that everyone at this symposium will do what they can to help increase awareness about the need for early diagnosis and hopefully to continue to develop treatment for those of us that were just not so lucky so that maybe we can get back the lives we lost. Thank you so much for your time and commitment to this terrible and misunderstood condition. Marisol has prism glasses to affect posture, postural tone, and near glasses. She's producing accommodative spasms, which is really abnormal postural tone in the eyes. When she started wearing the glasses, the burning pain behind her eyes that radiated down through the neck diminished the first week, and then the second week it stopped. Abnormal postural tone is a key issue here, and we're going to talk a lot more about it today. Thank you.